I was raised in uh, Pasadena Independent School District outside of Houston in uh, a mixed blood Choctaw family environment. I have uh, three brothers, one of whom is deceased, and an uh, older sister. Uh, I have uh, a grandbaby now. Uh, I graduated from University of Texas in 74 with an English degree and uh, started a company called New Canaan Farms in uh, 80, about 83, really 79 kind of, but it became a full-time occupation and built it to uh, a place where we had 100 employees and sat on 10 acres with a 6,000 square foot kitchen and were shipping all over the country to gift and gourmet stores, uh, fancy little gems and preserves. In the course of doing that, I started volunteering at schools to tell stories of uh, the Choctaw history and American Indian history and uh, developed a repertory of stories along that line. And at the same time, I started telling hero stories within the company, New Canaan Farms, and Ann Richards, who was governor of Texas then, hired me to go around to different ag extension services in Texas and tell these hero stories and encourage people that they could, uh, that they could do marketing uh, value added is the term I was looking for, that they could create value added to their products so it's not just strawberries sold by the bushel, but they could create a strawberry rosé wine ice cream syrup that no one had ever seen before and sell that same amount of strawberries, you know, for $7.95 a jar and a gift and gourmet and those kind of things. So I would inspire farmers to, to try to think of not selling by the bushel basket or by the pound to compete with the big farmers, but recognize that you had to be creative and that you could be creative. Uh, and we did that through, through hero stories. Look for the people that have people's strengths, that uh, recognize that if you're in the marketing business and everything is the marketing business, that the most important person is the person that relates directly to the customer the most. That becomes the most important person. So with New Canaan Farms, we always hired the friendliest, most intelligent, sharp people to answer the telephone. This is, this is not related to your question, but you'll appreciate this with a business background. I had a rule during the Christmas season from November to, uh, from the November 1st, which is when Christmas really happens, till December uh, 20th, that uh, no one could tell a customer no without getting my direct approval. And I was only there about 30% of the time. I, mean, I was out everywhere. I was selling. But and we didn't have cell phones. But unless they could get my direct approval, they couldn't say no to a customer. Now, the customer didn't know this, right? But if a customer would call and say, look, I had a jar of strawberry jam that was broken in my case. It got on some of the jar lids. I had to clean them up. I want a full case of nothing but strawberry jam to replace that. We'll be glad to do that, sir. Do you want it today or should we overnight it to you? I don't want to pay for it. I understand. What's your address, sir? <laughs> and you, I mean, it was fun. And think about the ladies that are answering the telephone to know that you talk about a sense of empowerment. I mean, they can say yes to anything, but they can't say no. They can't say no. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I, you know, I was doing a book tour a book one, a book of the year in Oklahoma. So I did 80 libraries, most, mostly rural. And he came down and afterwards, uh, I had talked usually between stories. I'll talk about gathering stories and the importance of gathering stories. Because I, uh, when people that I had interviewed and uh, collected their stories and I started writing some of the stories, uh, when one or two of them died, then I realized that uh, this is probably the only vocal record of on earth. You know, there might be a snippet of a some little tape that was made at a holiday season, but probably not. That they're gone and their voice will never be heard other than through the tapes that I've made. Do you tape all the people or do you jot down notes? I, is it I, audio tape, videotape, notes? I, I don't I do I do audio. And uh, since I'm dealing with, uh, with a lot of Indian people or Native American people, another discussion, but either's fine, uh, 
I found that when the camera goes on, there's a real, there's a self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. And people, if there's going to be a camera there, they'll dress differently. They want to look at themselves in the mirror. They're, they're just too self-conscious. And what uh, I do, and I learned this from hard experience, I carry both the digital and I do a little, uh, a real nice little uh, uh, tape, or cassette mm -hmm. tape. And I, this is just how I approach it. It's just what I do. But I, uh, I make sure that there's, I call them bridge builders. The person that is either related to that person or is a close friend of that person and has either gotten to know me or has heard about me and calls me and says, hey, my great uncle uh, down in, uh, in Hugo, uh, boy, he's, he's got some stuff about Goodland Indian School. I know he'd love to talk about it. And I'll say, well, that's great. Now, here's his phone number. Why don't you call him? And I'll say, no, let's don't do that. Why don't you call him? And, uh, well, he already said it was okay. I said, well, good. Then you call him, and, uh, and I'll give you, let me look at my calendar. I'll give you times when I could come. And so I'll say, here are times when I will be able to call your uncle and find out when would be a good time. Now, you, I want you to be there. And I'll say, oh, I don't need to be there. I'll say, no, let's find a time when you can be there because that's really, that'll, that'll work better. So... And I, I pretty much insist on that. I don't like to go cold turkey because I don't want the people to be, you know, have a stranger in their house. I want me to be brought in by someone that they really know. So the bridge is, is a lot of the difficulties of getting trust, and those are already taken care of before the doors even open. So are you saying stories find you, or you you find stories? I started, I started out knocking. You know, I would kind of knock, and I would say, but now... Uh, Oh, last 12 years or so, maybe a little more, the stories are coming to me and people are making requests and people want me much more than I can go out and accommodate. And, uh, but what I do with, say there, this, and this is interesting, I, I always I make sure that there is uh, some kind of a table or something between the person that I'm talking to because especially if they're an older person, if they're an Indian person, there needs to be some kind of a barrier. They need to feel some kind of a barrier between the two of us. You know? And it's much better if that barrier be just a physical, simple thing that is in their living room, like a table between us or their kitchen table. Otherwise, the barrier will be something that they put up. They'll put it up. So if this table were removed and the two of us are kind of leaning it together, then the person being interviewed is going to want to guard. You see what I'm saying? It's just psychological, but it's important. And I also found that uh, when a lot of times the most important things are said, as we were talking about before the camera goes on. So what I do, and this is, you know, I learned this stuff. I, I click on my digital recorder before I ring the doorbell. And when they open the door, they say, hi, how's it going? I say, hey, and we introduce, I say, now I've already got the recorder on. They say, oh, my voice sounds horrible. Okay, because they already know what we're up to, they know. And, and what happens is I usually get about 20, 30 minutes of how do you like your coffee, you know, I'll be back in a minute. And it's kind of wasted space in one way. But it's really not wasted space because you're, you're, there's an awful lot of social content a lot, a lot of cultural commission things going on. Uh, transmission is what I'm, cultural transmission is happening in the little social courtesies. If if they come in and, and the, are you thirsty? Can I get you something to drink? And I say, oh no, I'm fine. And they say, oh well good. And they sit down, then you know they're not from the South. Because <laughs> people from the South will say, can I get you something to drink? Oh no, I'm fine. Coffee or tea? Oh, I guess coffee. You like anything in it? Oh, no, I'm fine. Sugar or cream? Well, it's sugar. <laughs> you know, no means it's just the thing you say. Don't do anything special, but it doesn't mean no, not if you're from the South. So they go through all those things, and they bring the cookies or whatever. And another rule is whatever they put before you, you eat it. If they say, I have the best fried uh, possum tail, I clip it real close to the tail. I say, oh, that's just how I like it, you know. And you just you just do you just eat it, uh, and I like for when the questioning to begin to be uh, an easy transition, 
and I'll, I never come with questions, and I never want to go with certain things because I don't know their story. And this is different because you're asking, you have a certain body of information. But, uh, but these Indian people have hidden so much for so many years that what I'm after are the things that no one else has been able to uncover. And I think when people get to a certain age in life, they start to think, they start to be reflective and the past starts to come up and they're less afraid of the past now. What can they do to me now? You know, I'm already in this apartment, I'm 80 years old and I'm gonna take it away. And so they're open, they're, they start to open up. And I don't know why, but I think, uh, I think God gave me some way of approaching old people that old people just trust me. And I don't know what it is, but I think they so just trust me. Why did you start in, down this path and what motivated you? I, How did you start? Uh, I was raised in a, and I never, I didn't, Think about it till uh, actually till I went to OU, that I was raised in kind of an off, way off reservation, uh, Choctaw community, and it's with the head being my grandmother who was full blood, and then uh, my grandfather who was Scott Irish, which is where the Tingle name comes from, and uh, he left Georgia, uh, met my grandmother, and when the oil business kind of opened up. Houston Ship Channel refineries. Mm -hmm. They moved down just uh, before World War One. When they had their kids, uh, seven kids, so there was a community of Choctaws and offsprings and cousins, and we we clung together. We stayed together on weekends. We were there at my grandmother's place almost every day in the summer. We all lived in the same area. All her her kids are either uh, pipe fitters which means they travel literally all over the world, uh, or school teachers, or school teacher slash coach, or vice versa. And those are oral communities. The pipe fitters just, they tell stories about what happened to them in the Alaska pipeline, and they tell stories about, yeah, you won't believe in the Venezuelan jungle. And uh, My dad worked 10 years in Caracas, Venezuela, in the jungle, sit back of 26-foot boa constrictor skin, that he had shot with a hunting rifle from uh, the pipeline during a break. Uh, he worked for 10 years on the Gold Coast of Africa, and he, he brought back videotapes of uh, cutting a calf's throat and passing the sacrificial blood around African Christians that sacrificed the goat. They were Christians. He's, he worked for 10 years on barges laying pipeline across the Red Sea. So he's had an amazing, he had an amazing life. and. And they tell you know, these people that are doing these things. And school teachers are great storytellers and coaches. So I was raised in a community where the thing to do when we got together was sit in the backyard. It was always the backyard. There was always a barbecue pit going. There was always a cooler full of all kinds of beer. And then there was the constant coffee pot. And my grandmother would make donuts, fry donuts. People don't do that anymore. She would, she, in her fry later, she would fry donuts. So there was always fresh fried donuts, coffee, uh, beer, homemade bread, uh, and the barbecue pit always going. And if we were down on the Gulf Coast, it would be a giant gumbo pot that was always going. And then people just sitting around and they can just visit and let's go visit. You're gonna come over and visit for a while. Well, come over and visit for a while, I meant you show up about four in the afternoon and you leave about two in the morning or maybe you just throw a pallet out and spend the night. But uh, so that's a, it's a real oral community. And TV was black and white, and somebody would go wandering in and watch the TV, but it was never as interesting as what was going on in the backyard. Uh, so that's how I, I was raised with, with learning to listen and uh, with people that just told great, fabulous stories, but they didn't think of themselves at all as storytellers. Uh, and the hero stories that I heard growing up were, yeah, so-and-so down the way, his, uh, his his next door neighbor, he'd only been there for about six weeks, his next door neighbor, but when he lost his job, they promised him if he moved down, they'd get him a job. His wife couldn't find a job, he's gonna lose his pickup truck. Well, uh, my friend down there, he just, uh, he got him a job for a few days where he was, he, you know, 
He helped him out. He uh, They worked together in the evenings or weekends, just cutting trees, trimming trees, and that fellow finally found his job. You know, there were things about uh, working people, helping working people in troubled times. Those were the, the stories that I heard, so I grew up to value those things. Because my dad and his people never made judgments, my mom too, I mean, but they never made judgments on the basis of how much someone had. It was always how much can you count on them, how much does their word mean, and how much are they willing to just go to work when work needs to be done. That's that's the value system I was raised in. And uh, those are the stories that I still look for. So like it or not, I end up looking for more older people, I think, than I do young, and maybe that's a prejudice of my generation. So storytelling now, though, is going to transform to what I do. What you do. Yeah, so and I'm remembering what your original question was. It was how I got into storytelling. And I started uh, doing this formal kind of storytelling thing because two, two, actually there were, yeah, a couple. One was uh, when my son got to be age of going to elementary school, uh, I was real anxious for to see what was going on with American history, study of Indian, Indians and Native history, American history, and it just didn't happen. There just wasn't anything. He, he could have gone through all of elementary school without ever having heard the term Trail of Tears. And I know that was a huge impact on American history. I mean, on Supreme Court cases, and all the way American history, it was huge. And uh, it was just as if it didn't happen. You know, the Holocaust didn't happen. What? <laughs> it was just this little 15, 10 year bleep in German history or something. It didn't happen. Well, it did happen and I knew it happened because we were, the cousins were always taken out into the woods sometime in the summer, and the Choctaw aunts and uncles would tell us who we were and how we got to be here in Texas. How our great-great-grandfather walked over on the trail, how his mother died, how he carried her bones on the trail so they could be buried there, and I've probably walked, I've probably walked across the cemetery where those bones are buried in Scullyville, Oklahoma. That's where the early people on the trail, the, the bones are buried. So we were always told those stories and we were always cautioned, your grandmother doesn't want other people to know this. So don't be go talking about being Choctaw or Indian. This is for us. It was like it was a secret sect or club or society, which was pretty cool for a kid growing up, you know, we're special, you know. And every once in a while it would be uh, I would hear someone say some. I remember the word chosen. We're, uh, we're chosen. Anytime people can overcome all of this and still be prosperous, you know, God chose us because we're strong enough to do this. We're chosen. So it gave us, I grew up with a real sense of purpose of being chosen. Now, what I've come to believe is that we're all chosen. And some people, like Jonah, turn away from the choice. Some people don't see it maybe, but I think we're all chosen and I think some of us are lucky enough to be walking the footsteps that we were chosen to walk. So I've started volunteering to go to my son's schools and do Native American presentations, Indian presentations, and they thought, oh, you know, this will be fun. Come bring your drums and rattles and stuff. So every once in a while I'd bring a drum and rattle and I would sing a Christian hymn and I found out something really interesting. You know, all this stuff about prayer in schools, you can't pray in schools. If you do it in Choctaw, you can. <laughs> it's okay if you do it in Choctaw. They don't, they've never said a word, you know. Uh, so I'll sing, and then I'll put that aside, and I would tell them the story. And I started telling the story of the Trail of Tears in first person. Actually, it didn't start that way. It evolved that way. It started as a history lesson, and my whole front row at the Texas Folklife Festival, about 100 people under a tent, uh, I started out with the history lesson. I was going to tell them how these cruel white people passed out smallpox infected blankets and killed all these Indians and drove them off their land. And I started out like this, the activist reveal right off the bat. The activist cloaked in disguise is a more effective activist, you know. But that's another issue. <laughs> but I started off telling this and uh, the whole entire front row, every single person on the front row, stood up walked out. I was devastated. I had only done one minute out of a 30 minute Trail of Tears story and the rest of the audience it was as if 
They didn't have to leave now. The statement had already been made. And one or two of them got up and kind of left. But uh, and I finished the story, and I thought, my God, I'm not doing this justice. They're not, they're just, they're turning off. Something I'm saying is turning off. So I started telling the story from the eyes of a 10-year-old boy. And before you even realize what race he is, where he lives, the first word of the story is, I remember my mother. I remember my mother. I remember even before I could walk or talk, I remember pulling her hair and pulling it down. And, and the description, the boy plays this little blow-in-the-face game with his mother. And then uh, it moves on, and eventually his house is burned down, and you realize he's a Choctaw little boy, and it's the Trail of Tears. But for the first 10 minutes of the story, they think I'm telling a personal narrative about my mother. And then we move into things and they realize, oh my God, we've been listening to a boy. He's doing a first person thing. This is not Tim telling us his story. And I want that little thing because they already are so deeply involved in identifying with it. And that works. That works. So talk about first person, second person, how you make those transitions in a story. It's, uh, <clears throat> Somehow, I, I like to, to help the listener feel as if they, have a, they know somebody in this story. So if I'm put in the story in some way, then they feel as if, it's as if there was an old book called Pink and Say that was a real popular, and it was a slave boy who shook the hand of a man who shook the hand of a man who shook the hand of Lincoln. And it's the same kind of thing. If somehow I'm connected with the story, in any way, then, then the listener feels like they're only one generation removed from the story. So I can do, uh, uh, let's see, the story that I closed with uh, the session today, The Choctaw Way, it's told as a third person story. It's about an old man who kills a young man in a, in a battle. It's an accidental killing, it's a dispute, and he's condemned to die, but he's given 30 days to straighten his life out and to teach a young orphan boy, he has 30 days to teach that boy how to live. And it's told third person, but the way I introduced the story is how I learned the story. I was walking shoulder to shoulder with Charlie Jones, an old Choctaw man, and, and our conversations together, and then he tells me the story, and then I slide into the story that he told me. So. So it's a first-person story to begin, and then it becomes a third-person story. And if the transition is smooth, the audience doesn't notice when we slip from first-person to third-person. And then at the end of the story, we move back into first-person, and we're walking on the road again. The story's over, but the story's not really over. It's the same song that was sung throughout the story. We sing it as we walk on the road together. So uh, some stories are... Mm, there's a story that I didn't do this weekend called No Name, and it's a traditional Choctaw story, and it's third person all the way through. It's a traditional legend, but it's a story that resonates so strongly with, with uh, so many people in the audience that there's an identity there. I, I don't like to tell stories where there's, where there's a distancing. I don't like to just, you know, why would you tell this story over here? I mean, even if, maybe if it has a beautiful moral, maybe you would tell it, but I like some relationship. So the no-name story is about a father who disrespects his son because he has no name, he hasn't earned a name, and the whole story is about the son trying finally to please the father, and the girl that intervenes and tells him, I love you, you don't have to have a name, but he wants the name, and so he ends up dying trying to get the name, and everyone is devastated, but he has a chance he comes back in the body of another and he ends up marrying the one he loved in the body of another, but never telling anyone other than her who he is. And so when the one who came back receives a new name, with his father there crying because his son has died in battle, this man chooses no name as his name, as his brave honorable name. So it's all about fathers and sons and earning and, and you know, kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. How does a father get along with his son? And everybody knows that battle. Whether you're a mother or a sister, you all know that battle. And, uh, and it resonates. So that's a third-person story I feel real comfortable telling 
because it's it's my story. It's everybody's story. Uh, other. If a person's telling a short five minute story yeah. or three minute antidote examples, what are some techniques that can be useful, like in a classroom or whatever, <clears throat> if you haven't fleshed out a longer story? I think uh, the same elements that would work for a 30 minute story work for a three minute story, just not as many of them. So you still want to have, you still want to, to like the main character right off the bat. You want to give the audience some way of liking this person. And then there's a hint of some trouble that's likely to come, whether through character flaw, whether through enemies at work, some trouble that's going to come. And then it's impending trouble. It's coming close. And then you're right in the middle of the trouble. And you don't know what's going to happen, if he's going to live, he's, if he's going to die, what's going to happen. And then suddenly the trouble's gone and change has taken place. And I think that's the most important thing in an effective story. At the other end of the climax, just on the other side of the climax, like the, the boat sails off the waterfall and, and the whole, all you have in, in the conflicts is from the time the boat sails off the waterfall till it hits the rocks. or the water deep enough. It's going to hit one or the other, and that's how long you have. And then whatever happens down here, change happens. If it hits the water and he survives, then he's learned something. There's a, he'll never be the same again. He can't go back. And if it hits the rocks, there's change, but, but there's change. And I think a lot of stories miss that, but there needs to be a change. And the audience needs to see that change. And if a story works, there's some small bit of change in the audience's perspective and perception of seeing things. So if it's a three minute thing, it still needs, you need likability there, you need climax. And the more, and this is important, I think, the more universal the trouble is, the more effective the story is. Something like No Name, that it's a father-son kind of basic primal conflict. And then uh, the hint of trouble, trouble happens and then the change and then I like to tell students, once the body's dead, drag him off the stage. You know, you don't want to stay around and editorialize and explain what just happened. The audience gets it. You know, once the change happens, then then story's over. That's it. And then what? Uh, well, then if the session is over, then, you're done. then the people will stand up and hopefully it will resonate somewhere in their unconscious. What if you're following it up with another story? Let's say you're doing a series okay, of stories. Okay. So tell us how you, is there some uh, There's a magic way? formula. Okay. <laughs> there is a magic formula. And uh, it's, uh, and breaking the formula is always fun too. You know, when you have something that works, it's always good to, to vary. But the formula, and I'm going to give Elizabeth Ellis credit for formalizing this. Uh, the story, let's say we're, we're telling, let's do, let's say, three stories in a 45-minute period. Am I moving out of range here? Sure. Okay. Uh, the first story, oh, okay, the, what I did today, what I did today is a pretty good example. I, the story, the performance really started today uh, when the first uh, 20 people came in. That's when the performance really started. I started uh, trying to visit with some folks on one side of the audience and uh, they weren't really very responsive. It was a bunch of guys mostly in uniform. I went over here, and there were four or five girls over there, and I started visiting with them. Well, I said, uh, I said I'm thinking about telling a story about when me and my little brothers set my big sister's hair on fire. And they went, whoa, you did that? And they laughed, and, I, and so I kind of visited with them and talked to them about it. And that's when the performance really starts, because I'm warming up the audience. I'm getting them to know me as people, so when I come up here, I'm not the visiting artist, you know. I'm, I'm a guy that is talking to him, is visiting with him. So the first story I told was the humor story about when we got together, all, us taunting our big sister all the way through. And humor opens people up. It, it relaxes people. The guards go down. They can identify with that. They've had siblings. And I asked the question, you know, how many of you have had siblings? 
how many of you had big families? So people are responding. And then uh, there was a musical break. Now, if there had not been the musician here, then I would have picked up the flute. And I would have played, uh, I would have played uh, a real sprightly kind of Navajo or a, or a Lakota song, a pretty Indian song, but real upbeat and kind of sprightly because the story I'd just done was like that. So you want to make the transition smooth. I would have played it. And then uh, I would have set it down, pause, pause, thank you, thank you, you know, I get my drum, and then I would have sung kind of a slow hymn. So uh, the flute, the flute is, it has a melancholy thing to it, even if you're playing sprightly. So it's an easy transition to a hymn. And then by the time I finished with the hymn, then the audience is in the hush place that you want them for that last serious spiritual story. But you can't, it's, it, you, you wouldn't want to jump from one to the next. Not everybody can play the flute and... You musical. can do it with, it can be done with, uh, a style of speaking to, you know. So I finished that story, and the last line is a joke about is uh, how when my sister brings all the brothers together, we slice a turkey, and we always feed a little bit to her favorite little dog to see if he appears over it and dies. And the implication is one of these days she's going to try poisons for what we did to her. And uh, so I turn around and get a drink of water. Somehow they're applauding, you know. There's a little break, some little break. And then I come back, and I say... Uh, could say something like, you know, uh, uh, in spite of all of that, somehow, siblings, do we love each other, or do we, how do we do this thing with siblings? And it's the same way with parents, you know. And uh, sometimes I think we say the worst things to the people we love the most, and we just have to remember that. And a great transition piece that I love to use, I don't know, if, I think you heard it maybe Monday, about how my dad talked about stones, how we all have the people that we love, we have a stone in our pocket with their name on it, and it is their weaknesses. The thing that if we ever pull this stone out and hit them with it, we will forever be triumphant, and they are gone, and they always know we're the strong winner here. And he said, guess what, son? You have that stone with my name on it, and I have that stone with your name on it. And the reason we managed to come back together again after all these years is neither one of us ever threw the stone. And that's the, that's the thing to remember with people. It's not not knowing their weakness. It's not only think good thoughts about them. It's that when you're most angry at them, just realize that, okay, I'm still not going to throw the stone. There's still people. And, and see, that little story about my dad would be a wonderful transition because we've gone from sibling, we've gone to a serious thing about sibling a little bit, and we've gone to father imparting information to his son, and then we could do that story the Choctaw way. So you can do it. So then those little, those little gems that can, take, that can take 45 seconds or two minutes become really important, very important little jewels on the, on the belt of your, of your performance. Those are little jewels that, that service the flute or that service the drum. Uh, some people, I've seen Bobby Norfolk, do it with poetry, uh, just a, a recitation of a, of a poem, a, a simple poem, a moral poem, a beautiful poem. Uh, so it can be done in a, in a lot of different ways. And I tell students, I, I have, uh, sometimes I'm on key, sometimes I'm not. My voice cracks when I sing. I can't sustain a note. You know, I can't sing. But I create characters that also can't sing, and I sing in their voice. <laughs> So I'm not marketing my singing. I'm just I'm just an old guy that's gonna die next week. And mercy, how can you not like him singing? And you know, so you just sing in the old craggly voice of your character, and no one judges you on your ability to sing. It's him, and we love him. We're not gonna talk about he can't sing. <laughs> it's really true, and I teach that in workshops. What are some other tricks? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> let's see the back just before. Uh, we get off of the uh, question, which was a great one about about how you kind of uh, move from one to the next. Elizabeth Ellis says you start out with the uh, ha stories. And they're like ha ha stories. Then you move to the ah stories, and then you move to the aha story. 
So you start out with humor, move to kind of a mid-level story, which has a degree of seriousness or a little moral or a little lightness to it, but then you close with the, with the spiritual story. The send them, send them out on a cloud. You know. uh, other uh, body language that's extremely simple and suggestive and breaking the rules with body language. So if you want to be open up with communication, you know, you would never fold your arms. You would never, there's certain things that the body language people teach you. But if you want to be natural, natural people that aren't trying to win an interview or something, they do all kinds of body language things. And I love to go into uh, restaurants where no one, you know, by myself, and I travel a lot. I, I go to a lot of, uh, I, I sit in a lot of airports. And I love it when a plane is late. And I really do love it because that gives me a chance to either write or to study people. And uh, people are just are amazing. When they're exhausted, the plane's late, you know, and they, whew, and they just be who they are. And my goodness, I love to. Because one of the things, and someone actually pointed out to me, they said, I never heard a public speaker do, do this before, you know, and just act like they were just, oh, what am I going to do now? And I find myself in the course of some stories not being a character doing that, but just kind of doing this, talking to the audience. And, and this is a folded arm thing. It's a block to communication, but somehow it's natural and it can kind of work. So don't think that all the gestures have to be the preacherly kind of gestures. I mean, you can choreograph. You saw some of that with, uh, with hallelujah, hallelujah, but there's another word, son. It's a amen, and there's a, it's a amen, and it's a amen, son. Don't ever cast your amen vote unless you're willing to pay for it. So, you know, there are those kind of gestures that are somewhat choreographed, but then just, uh, I think in the course of a story, it's important every once in a while to just be you and not to be and and it's this is different a lot of people are going to tell you never get out of character always stay in the character always remember the energy flow is the important thing well that's theater this is a different thing you know if i'm if i'm true to that old man that told me this story then I'm, i don't want to just act all the time I want to create some beautiful colors on the palette for people to appreciate the palette. But every once in a while, I just want to pull out a pencil and scrawl a little pony like a kid would, like anybody could do. I want to just talk to people. And uh, if my ear itches, you know, sometimes I want to just be able to itch my ear. It's okay, it's not all acting. In fact, none of it's really acting. The acting is a, is a, is a way to get them in the door because if they think it's not going to be entertaining, they wouldn't come. But I'm not, I'm, you know, I want to entertain them. I want to play the flute. I want to do the tap dance. But when it comes down to it, it's never about any of that. It's about just sitting with people that will listen to somebody else talk about what some old man said before he died. And that's really, uh, so my favorite parts of the stories aren't when I'm belting the things out. They're when we're all just quiet enough and it's just us here. That's what you want. That's the hardest thing to do, or the easiest, is to just get it to where it's just us here. It's just us. You know, old man uh, Charlie Jones told me, uh, said that man is buried just right over there in that cane break. And, uh, and he showed up. He could have got away. He could have rode a horse and got away. But he'd been teaching that boy about how important your honor is. And he knew he had to die. He had to show up because for his crime and die so that boy could grow up and be strong. And it's just us here talking about it. And that's the gap. It's letting these people know that on the other side, in my head, is this guy. And I'm doing everything I can to get his spirit across to them. And, I, and I, there have been times when I've been telling, when I really had the sense that this spirit is the one talking. And if I can just get out of the way enough, it'll do its job. And I know that sounds real esoteric, and I don't mean this occult kind of way of looking at that, but there's a sweetness about it sometimes. When you tell a story over and over, is it how similar is it each time you tell it? It, it depends on the audience. 
it's it's going to change a lot according to the audience. Uh, I told the Crossing Book Chitto story up at Indian Hill, and there were a lot of kids there, and uh, adults with two and three kids. So I told the full range of Martha Tom cutting up and look at what I can do, and you know just cutting up, cutting up. And I told it last night, and there were maybe six or eight kids in the audience, but they were with university parents, so it was a different kind of performance. It was less family, more university. And so when I told the same story, she said it once or twice, but I didn't focus on the slapstick humor at all. It was moving on to the narrative of the social conflict between slavery and how that's resolved, how the Indians, uh, sometimes uh, time, if I have, I think of that story, Crossing Boat Chitto, as being like a 22, 25 minute story, but I can tell it in 12. If I have to, I can tell it in 12. You know the story well enough that you know the scenes that just have to be there for the narrative to move along, and you know the scenes that if you want people to, if you want to see people be moved and cry, then this has to be there. This needs to be there. I'm depriving people when I don't do this. But sometimes the, res the time constraints just won't allow for this to happen. And that's a shame, but sometimes you're, you're left with that. You've talked about how you find stories uh, tell us how you practice stories, how you go about refining stories. Uh, how often do you practice? How long does it take oh, for a story all to... All the time. I mean, work. when... when Oh, I don't... I used to have a... Uh, like, I'm going to practice an hour today. I'm going to practice... I'm going to rehearse 30 minutes today. And I would... Uh, pick a story and I would do that story and I would tape record that story and listen to myself doing the story, turn the tape recorder off, do the story again and do it three or four times when I felt like I had a pretty decent version of it. Then when I would drive, I would plug that story into the tape, I would listen to the story, I would do it with the tape and then finally I would just pop the tape out and then I knew the story, I would do the story. Uh, one technique that I, that I teach and it really works if you're working from a written source. Uh, Find a space where no one's going to bother you for several hours. It's real hard today, but find one. You've got time, you've got your favorite beverage. Read the story start to finish uh, five times. And a good length for a story is about 2,000, 3,000 words max uh, for a told story. And I like for people starting out, a five minute story is the way to do. Don't try to tell a 10 or 15 minute story. They'll be nice to you, but you're boring them. Start with a five-minute story, even if it's just a short little anecdote, a five-minute story. And uh, then uh, I'll tell the story, and I'll tell the story, read it over, read it over. Okay, okay, cancel that. I lost my thought for a second. All right, you've got your story. You've got the right length of the story. And then read the story five times start to finish. And by the time you get to about the third reading, it's boring you because you know everything that's going to happen. Make yourself focus. If you count yourself down, whatever you need to do to reach that alpha kind of state where your mind is just ooh, it's sponge, sponge place. Read the story over five times and then put the story aside and never look at it again. Never look at it again. Never go back to see if you got it right. Never go back to see if I missed this line. Never look at it again. Because if you've done your mental work, not reading it, but your mental work, counting yourself down, really focusing on what you're going to do, then those five times are more than enough. Never look at it again, and then, uh, and then go stand in front of your favorite tree and tell it. The last people I would tell it to would be the family, because the family will be the most critical at the wrong times. Don't practice on family, but just go, go tell it to a tree. And what happens when you read, 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 and then never look at it again is you have to tell it in your own voice because you can't remember those words. We don't think in words. We think in pictures, picture images. So you've got the picture images in your mind and just tell it. And if you leave parts out, it's okay. You'll make something up similar to it and put it in. But that way you're telling the story in your own voice, and that's, that's so important. That's so important. I've heard people do, uh, like, they take a poem and they want to do their own version of the poem 
Well, it kind of works, except we know some of the lines of the poem. <laughs> so there's an inauthenticity to that. You know? uh, but narratives, uh, take the story Hansel and Gretel. We all know what happens, but we, if someone tells it in their own voice, we're not going to go back and say, oh, that's wrong. That's not how it was written here, because the story is the thing. And, uh, Talk about voice use. <clears throat> uh, how does one improve that, that the uh, little technique you want me to talk to you about the, the uh, 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 Dub C. Newberry who was a public speaker and traveled with uh, after dinner circuit all over America for many years he was very good uh, he teaches, used to teach at Southwest Texas, it's Texas State University in San Marcos right now. He saw when I started to do some public speaking, and I started getting serious about public speaking, not just the storytelling I was doing in my son's schools, but the public speaking uh, Toastmasters in 1988. And I really, I really recommend Toastmasters for anyone that wants to do any kind of public speaking. And I've heard storytellers say, oh, they count the odds. Oh, they criticize you on this, on that, on this, on that, and that. Well, we need that. We need that. So what Toastmasters does, it builds an internal clock. You know, I lost a district level contest once in Toastmasters because I went over by 10 seconds on my speech. 10 seconds. I had no, pro I mean, 10 seconds, that's the rule. I knew it. But what it does is it builds an internal time clock, internal time clock. So, uh, W.C. saw I was starting to do this Toastmaster work, and he said, he said, how do you feel about your voice? And I said, I think it's rotten, W.C. I think I don't, God just didn't give me a good voice. I didn't talk. And now people say, oh, you have such a good voice. You have such command of your voice. And I still, you know, eh, it's okay. It's passable, you know, but I don't think that it's not, it's not a great voice. You know, not, but I work on it, and I still work on it. But W.C. said, Simplest thing to do, and in about in about ten minute phone conversation, probably even closer to five, he changed everything I did in terms of my voice, and he gave me enough material to work on the rest of my life. He said, uh, "Find an open field outside, just uh, go to a public park or something. Open field is better. There's not anybody else around. You can say as loud as you want to. You can move around. People aren't going to arrest you thinking you're crazy." And uh, Everybody has a rhythm in their voice. Everyone speaks in a certain rhythm. You know, we, we syncopate, we, we give little vocal gestures and little in, uh, affectations. So if someone knows you, they can't quite hear what's being said, really can't hear the tone of your, just by your voice rhythms, they could know who it was. They don't know how, but they know, oh, that's so-and-so, he talks like that, you know. So he said, to practice that, to discover what your voice rhythm is, go out in that open field, count to 10. Just count to 10 all the way through. Count to 10 again, don't even think about it. And then count to 10 and stop at what seems to be a natural place before you get 10. And then count a few more numbers and then finish it. And he said, do that for a few minutes. Just count to 10. You'll feel silly doing it, but you'll discover what your own voice rhythm is. And then when you discover what that voice rhythm is, make sure that that voice rhythm is in your speaking and then once you have that pattern that you know then you can create variations of that voice rhythm and the audience will be they'll be drawn to the tune that they know and then when there's a variation on it it they lean forward and they listen they don't know why but something some other little musical instrument has floated in and it's a cool thing to know what your voice rhythm is but then change it you know change it uh, and then he said after you've done that for a while the last 15 minutes a day last five minutes of it count to 10 but add gestures so just a couple of examples okay so I would go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten one two three <laughs> four five six seven eight nine ten one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just uh, and so you practice, and then you add the gestures to it, 
and it's a great and the reason you count numbers and not any kind of words at all is words have associations and as soon as you lock onto those associations you start dramatizing something or doing something that relates to that word so 10 is safe you don't have to think of anything and we can all count to 10 and it's a great speech exercise it's a wonderful one and dialogue uh, the first uh, five years I told stories I had almost no dialogue. Nobody talked to each other in the stories. And I thought they were the most well-crafted things. And, and uh, nobody ever talked. You know? and, and I had a little kid come up to me one time. And I used to tell this story all the time. I would never have gone out of town for a day and not told this story. you know. And now I haven't told it in a long time. It's called Danny Black Goat. It's going to be a children's book one of these days, a, a young adult chapter book. Uh, Navajo kid taken away from his family on the long walk because he keeps trying to escape. He's a rebel, and he's thrown into a prison now in Texas with a lot of Civil War prisoners. And this one guy, Jim Davis, takes him under his wing because he knows the boy's going to get killed. And he starts to teach him. But there was no dialogue. And the story was all about people. No dialogue. And a little kid, a little bitty five-year-old kid came up and he tucked my shoulder. And I'd done the story at Six Flags Over Texas and he said, Mr. That Jim Davis guy, he's really funny. He's a funny guy. And I thought, no, he's not. Kid? And I didn't say that. But I started thinking, well, people are reading humor into this story where I didn't see it because they're hungry for something. I'm not giving them. And so I started working on a line or two that Jim Davis would say that would be funny. And that was the beginning of dialogue in my stories. I had really told stories for almost five years with almost no dialogue in the stories. No wonder people got up and left. But dialogue is the way to let people know what, who people really are. And since there's not, you don't have whole long conversations in stories then what you say needs to be very natural but very representative dialogue. And I, I find when I'm working on a story a lot, I've been doing this Alcatraz story, this Clarence Carnes escape story now, for almost a year. It's gonna be it's gonna be a book and I'm real serious about it. And in uh, in two weeks I've got a ninety minute performance of that story at uh, symposium in Vancouver, British Columbia, ninety minute concert of that story. And when I'm working on that, I find myself in daily conversations. I'll say, uh, I'll say, uh, we better don't get that ice cream. You might gain too much weight, huh? <laughs> and people look at me. They say, what? I say, oh, I'm going to pass on the ice cream. Because <laughs> I find myself thinking so much like that character that how the character talks comes out. And it's not memorized dialogue. I just kind of know the voice inflections and the double negatives and the way this guy talks. So I find myself kind of talking like that. Uh, but I, I love, I love dialogue. And it lets you, it really lets, part of me say, thinks it lets facets of your personality that are slumbering wake up and play for a little while. Uh, kids talking to adults. And with dialogue, I don't think you, it's not as if you're mimicking this voice. You're just, uh, you're just thinking like that character. You're not, you're, I'm not trying to change my voice deliberately. I'm just imagining I'm that character. And so if I'm that, if I'm that little kid, then sometimes I'll just be kind of shrugging my shoulders like this and I'll, you know, do a little, the kind of thing that a kid might do and it helps the voice to change. So I don't want to do that right now. Do I have to? You know, and I didn't change my, I didn't change my voice a lot, but it comes through because of what you're doing with gestures and the other stuff. And uh, well, I think you better, kid. Have you seen? You know how your mother's going to feel about this. What do you think? Oh, Dad, okay. You know, and you don't have to change a lot. Now, I've seen people that think that you have to be the dad here and you have to be the kid here. Yeah, you know, and you don't. Because they're not buying that. It's just him. 
and and uh, if you try to trick them into thinking it's not Tim anymore, you'll never trick them. <laughs> when you trick them into thinking it's not Tim anymore, is when you're just being you're just being Tim all the way to the core. You're just being who you are all the way to so the core. So what you're saying is that as a storyteller, you just be yourself. Yeah. Using yeah verbal dialogue. Yeah, issues, absolutely. And those kinds of things. Yeah, just be yourself. And if part of me is really fascinated with these people I've interviewed, then that's part of me too. And I want to tell them about these people. And the best way to tell them about these people is every once in a while I'll tell them in the voice that those person that that person speaks. So how do stories change people, or how do they impact people, or do they change people and impact? Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, the story begins by uh, by changing the teller, and I think oftentimes we 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 go to the story not so much because it tells our story the most, it reflects us, but we go to the story unconsciously that we need to hear the most. Um, we're attracted to what we need to hear. So if there were a fellow that loved interviewing old farmers then what he really wanted to hear was some kind of affirmation that his father's spirit is still there alive. And he's hearing it in all these other people because we all seek our family members everywhere. And when I go to these old Choctaw people, I think I want to go to the father that I, I saw a glimpse of, but I know that he's still out there somewhere. And I'm looking for that spirit to be alive. And when you go to the story you need to hear, eventually you're going to hear it. And it's going to change you because you went looking for that change. And then when you tell the story to the audience, they see that it's changed you. And if they're open, you've done your job, then they're going to carry enough of that off with them. And it might make a change there. It might make a change. I, I know that when I interview the old people, and this is very much related to the change in storytelling, I started years ago making a promise, making it explicit that whatever character in any story that they told me that I would use, I would make sure that that character were honored, that there would be no despicable, unredeemable characters in any story that I tell. And if I can't find the redeeming quality, then the fault is mine. I would either take that person out, if they were necessary, I wouldn't tell the story. So if you find a compelling story, it's usually compelling because the villain makes the story. The trouble makes the story. Death is the villain in that Choctaw Way story. He never shows up, but he's always there. The villain makes the story. So then our challenge as writers and storytellers is to find some redeemable quality about that. And I keep that promise to the point where now in the Choctaw Nation, people know I make that promise, they know I honored it, and I'm not making it anymore, but they know I keep it. So if I'm looking at every story I hear for a redeemable and some good in every single character in the story, and storytelling is so much a part of my living being, then what does that say about me at the service station? going in to pay for gas waiting in a line. I can't turn that off. I found myself looking for that spark of goodness in everybody that I saw. <laughs> and then I realized how much the stories have changed me. That in making the promise to look for the good in every character, 